invitation, Jonathan, and also um, Liam. I'm very flattered to be here. Um, so to be clear, my, my talk is going to be about how you can derive the necessity of uh, socialism as a political alternative from um, a game theoretic model, given the <laughs> Di different political tradition. OK, so. <laughs> Um, so I'll get started. So my talk is called Value Pluralism Against Liberalism. And I think um, I think it's not as polemical as it sounds, but we'll see what you all think of it. In my circles, it's not as polemical as it sounds. Um, so during the Cold War, the West debated the relative merits of socialism and communism. As long as there was a communist left in the West to defend the former. In the past 35 years, not so much. Capitalism was the clear winner. In the eyes of many, capitalism's virtue is that it has made fast friends with liberalism. Liberalism respects the fact of pluralism in the polity and therefore allows value pluralism to flourish within reasonable constraints. State socialism, also not so much. Thus, Western political philosophers, and please forgive me for being a little uh, broad in my stroke, um, there are exceptions, I know, they accepted the trade-off between equality and liberty and the alternatives of capitalism and socialism uh, that they seem, seem to present. Uh, liberty also tends to be a clear winner. Um, so to be clear what the kind of thing that we're talking about, I'd like to give you a little visual, if I can actually get the visual. There we go. Um, so where I live now in, in Germany, um, someone made this map uh, recently on nerdy maps. And uh, you can see this uh, a very clear dynamic. Um, you notice all these nice colors here, the reds, the blues, the maroons. OK, we've got uh, it could be more pluralistic yeah, because we're talking about basically a, uh, a spectrum of Catholics to Protestants. But you see um, that this is a polity that basically um, incorporates um, people with different worldviews, different religions in particular. And then on the other side of the old East West Germany border, um, you have this very stark uh, all black and gray and drab part of the map. And I think that that's probably how most people think about uh, state socialism and its effect on social life. So uh, when you think about West Germany, you think, aha, I go to Berlin and the techno clubs and look how uh, fun this all is at Oktoberfest in Bavaria. And then you think about East Germany and you're like, oh my God, these terrible buildings and um, <laughs> what must they have done with their time and, and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that there's a very clear selection out of a certain set of values. And then it seems like things become the same. And this is what people are worried about. Now, um, some per peculiar trends have emerged since capitalism and liberalism developed such a bond. First, liberalism and capitalism seem to have broken up in much of the former Soviet bloc. Uh, second, um, so for example, all of these uh, regions over here, there's quite a little fascism problem happening over there, and people wonder why. If they were living under communism, it must be that they didn't acclimate themselves to liberal democracy, and so uh, the barbarians over there are not quite used to our form of life. Um, this is a very significant problem. Uh, second, a pervasive sense of capitalism in crisis since 2008 has shaken liberals' confidence in the system. Political philosophers are now in the midst of a maturing debate about economic alternatives. Uh, the options that are on the table are market socialism and property owning democracy. Those are the favorites. And tr uh, interestingly, the debate about economic alternatives is hitched to a debate about the relative merits of republicanism liberalism or some combination of the two and uh, republicanism is the rising favorite here oops so here's a little map of like i, I think of what uh, the current terrain in this literature is like so if you don't do political philosophy um this is the kind of thing we like market socialism quite a bit here are some of the well-known authors you might be familiar with uh people like david schweikart or john romer um, Council communism has also kind of emerged in the conversation. Aaron Beninov and uh, James Muldoon have been writing about that. Um, there's a world of people who are interested in property owning democracy, and these are the, the Rawlsians in the cohort. Um, it comes from uh, Rawls's final uh, book in 2001. He finally concedes um, that capitalism and liberal justice are not compatible and says maybe uh, property owning democracy is better. Uh, so everyone in the society would be a property holder. Uh, and then there's also people who are interested in a UBI as a kind of transitionary reform. If we stop people being defendant on a uh, dependent on a wage and we give them um, an alternative, 
a form of income, then this will significantly lessen the inequality and the dependency that people have on capitalist markets. Okay, so you might uh, notice um, familiar, a familiar voice might be Stuart White at Oxford, Alan Thomas, uh, James Mead, more of a historical figure at this point. So in this talk, I want to explore the possible connection between republicanism and socialism as a political and not just economic form, because in all of these areas of debate, uh, republicanism has emerged, council communism, we're suddenly thinking about uh, republicans in, in Germany in the Weimar period and before, uh, market socialism, we're suddenly wondering what went on in the attempts to reform uh, the old Soviet bloc, people were kind of trying to transition to something more democratic, uh, property owning democracy, I said about roles. Um, and UBI. And the, and the reason I'm going to talk about this is not just an economic form, is that in the Hegelian Marxist tradition, economic and political forms make up a social totality. One cannot expect to change the mode of production without transforming the state and vice versa. But the political merits of the case for Republican socialism are not yet so clear. We're working on these kind of, can, can one of these models work? Can it respect the basic liberties and so on? Um, but the kind of politics of it are not that straightforward. I take it as given that socialist projects, including social democratic ones, have always sought political and not just economic hegemony, which involves convincing the social majority that labor's political leadership benefits everyone. This is a historical project. Even if one isn't a worker, one ought to find socialism desirable. I'm going to focus on the issue of value pluralism, taking this opportunity to build a case that, with a little help from socialism's Republican friends, value pluralism can flourish under socialism. There, that map that I showed you of East Germany does not have to be what our socialist future, should we want it, looks like. Um, there are socialist objections to building this case, of course, which I, I try to address. Ultimately, um, I argue that value pluralism cannot be taken at face value. One must ask value pluralism about what and for whom. With regard to this question, capitalism is not as pluralistic as it seems. Liberalism, insofar as it is paired with capitalism, is neither neutral about the good life, nor does it avoid selecting for some fundamental values over others. And I make the very orthodox Marxist point that one can find the best evidence for this claim in the conflict between capital and labor, which has ripple effects throughout the society. I conclude that socialism and value pluralism can repair their relationship, which is very good news for socialism as a political alternative. So what is value pluralism? What does it have to do with capitalism? Value pluralism is the idea that human values are irreducible to one another. In the first place, it is a social fact. As a human being, I live in a world made up of other people whom I do not choose to be thrown into the world with. They think differently than I do because they have different experiences, points of reference, and interests. As a result, they value different things than me. Another person may value many of the same things I do, friends, family, philosophy, but they weight them differently. Philosophy matters to me a lot, but perhaps it matters to my colleague less relative to something else. Or perhaps I find great fulfillment in my work, but to my best friend, my work sounds dreadfully like staying in school for my entire life. <laughs> so in the second instance, value pluralism is a nexus of competing moral, social, and political priorities. Value pluralism has a distinct analytical and political relationship with liberalism. Post-war liberalism, as I continue to try to understand it, tries to marry the fact and value elements of value pluralism. It accepts the fact of pluralism and then tries to create a lexical ordering of values that everyone can find acceptable. The question that liberalism tries to answer is, what principles can everyone who values different things endorse so that we can have a well-ordered society that is built on mutual cooperation and not endemic social antagonism. There are a few exa different examples of how liberal political philosophers motivate this question. The main idea is that social cooperation is required for a well-ordered society, which, if it is to be well-ordered, must establish such principles. There must be some values that overlap enough to warrant constraining the scope of value pluralism in a polity. For Rawls, this means finding some consensus about what form of pluralism is reasonable or else it will inhibit social cooperation. So you can't give a talk in political philosophy without Rawls, here he is. Rawls ask, asks, and by what criteria are we to judge that 
the justice of custom itself and the legitimacy of these expectations, all the many expectations. To reach some measure of understanding and agreement which goes beyond mere de facto resolutions of competing interests and a reliance on existing conventions and established expectations, it is necessary to move um, to a more general scheme for de determining the balance of precepts or at least for confining it within narrower, limit, narrower limits. The most obvious sorts of conflicts of interest that rely on existing conventions and expectations are those such as religion, sexual practices, or aesthetic preferences. But the issue of pluralism digs deep into economic values too. Ronald Dworkin, um, who I couldn't find a quote of, it's just the way he writes, I'm sorry, but I'll paraphrase it to you. Uh, Ron Ronald Dworkin asks, how can a society that is committed to the popular but mysterious ideal of equality deny someone the resources that they think they need to live a valuable life? If people value different things, so his example is Jack loves, uh, values luxury, uh, Jill values simplicity, then on what basis can a society tell Jack that he can't have what he wants? Do constraints on Jack amount to telling him he ought to value and endorse an ideal of a good life? So if you want to live in luxury and someone tells you you can't have so much stuff, you just can't do so much of that, are you putting undue constraints on that person given that it is a value that they have? How reasonable can such ethical judgments be if, it under, if they undermine the value that someone places on the goodness of their own lives? Thus, value pluralism has a social and an economic dimension. Justice is not just a matter of giving everyone a baseline, a set of resources, and then relinquishing questions of value to the private sphere for a, uh, a moral free-for-all. Um, Will Kim McGuck puts it like this. Liberty is needed precisely to find out what is valuable in life, to question, re-examine, and to revise our beliefs about value. This is one of the main reasons why we desire liberty. We hope to learn about the good. We don't already know what it is, but we need to find out for ourselves what it is. In other words, liberalism is what allows us to get to know what is reasonable in a society where other people can do the same. Liberalism is the framework that tries to work its way out of the skeptic's conclusion that it is impossible to reconcile people to a common set of values. It works with and against the fact of value pluralism to make what is incommensurable, commensurable. Now, why is the matter of making incommensurable values commensurable important for understanding liberalism's relationship to capitalism? It is important simply because liberals tend to accept that capitalism is the institutional basis for the resolution of the problem of value pluralism. Now, I don't wanna put this too polemically, but um, as I know there are strict egalitarians and a kind of cohort of left Rawlsians who say that their views preclude, preclude such a thing. They don't determine the institutional uh, configuration of the principles of justice. Um, but let's get real. If you take one step down a, le a level of abstraction, um, from normative theory to the historical and institutional context in which political philosophers tend to discuss and endorse value pluralism, then it seems plain that this context is a capitalist one. It is only when pushed by their more institutionally minded critics that liberals in principle occasionally reject capitalist institutions as unjust. At the moment, capitalism and liberalism are both facing a crisis of legitimacy, however. It is perhaps easier now to imagine their partnership coming undone. In previous generations, value pluralism was the great virtue of the open society, which might sound familiar at a popper lecture, and was conceptually tied to capitalism. Even if the intuitions backing this position have weakened, in the sense that those who hold it feel like they need to actually mount a defense of it, which has not always been true, it's worth recalling the mid-century argument that capitalism is the structure that steers a society away from both 20th century forms of totalitarianism. In a word, liberalism is the normative structure of a society that allows value pluralism to flourish by making individuals the fundamental moral entities in a system of basic liberties. As Karl Popper put it, liberalism is anti-totalitarian because it avoids the nostalgia of tribal patri patriarchy, where the wise few rule over the ignorant many in the time before the fall. Capitalism is liberalism's institutional partner because it neither fixes political ends, so it avoids paternalism, nor does it make individuals depend on centralized sources of information and decision-making, which allows civil society to flourish. 
So uh, Hayek makes this argument. Liberals take civil society to be the criti be critical for pluralism to have a healthy institutional form. Now, uh, what does uh, value pluralism have to do with socialism, except for in the eyes of liberals, not very much. Um, so by contrast, there are numerous objections to bringing socialism and value pluralism together, and not all of them actually come from liberals. I'll lay out three of the most important objections from both liberals and their socialist counterparts. These constituencies have different concerns, but when one lays them out side by side, um, one can see that they actually agree that socialist pluralism is not an ideal worth pursuing. First, liberals argue that socialism presupposes one idea of the good life, which of course precludes pluralism. At bottom, socialism forces each individual to share in the life project of building a socialist society. It is a classless society that seeks to harmonize individual interests into an ideal of the common good. Socialists say that socialism is about a form of collective social freedom that allows each individual to view their own freedom as an element of how collective freedom unfolds. Another way of putting it is that the self-realization of society demands that individuals subordinate their particular ideals for a greater good. They recognize themselves and higher ideals so as to make those ideals concrete. So this is all very Hegelian if you'd like to pin it. Um, critics say that the socialist position effectively denies pluralism that, de that democracy requires. In demanding that individuals identify completely with a social mission that is greater than themselves, the socialist rejects from the outset unreconcilable diversity in human life. In a classless world, they imagine away the realm of human contestation, communication, and diversity. diversity. Um, they they, this imaginary world erases social differences by denying the fact of li uh, pluralism that liberalism preserves. Socialism is homogenizing, and therefore, this is what Shayla Ben Habib argues, for instance, it denies politics, and as a result, it denies freedom. The second liberal objection is what I call the don't be an American rube objection. It goes like this. And yes, I'm being cheeky, please forgive me. You've got a bad case of the capitalism over there. Seems pretty brutal, but there are varieties of capitalism, don't you see? And your objections to it only apply to the unrestrained sort of capitalism that is so inhospitable to human life that you are used to. There are not only two possibilities, capitalism or socialism. So again, Karl Popper says, but many varieties within capitalism. Socialism, by contrast, has few varieties. It is the ultimate rationalization of society such that innovation and variety become possible. The third liberal objection is that abuses of political power are easier to correct for in a capitalist system than in a socialist one. If one understands socialism as public ownership over the means of production and central planning, then socialism builds corruption right into state institutions. A state structure that allows no independence to competing centers of power like the market puts individuals at the mercy of a ruling clique that uses the structure to enrich themselves without oversight. In a capitalist economy, however, voters can choose between better or worse responses to economic problems, which makes state officials more responsive to the public. Socialism simply creates a large and opaque bureaucracy that is hostile to external criticism. Now for the socialist objections, if, as if that wasn't enough. The first socialist objection is that value pluralism is a bourgeois ideal since it is a mirror image of market logic. Capitalism is not only a free market, but a free marketplace of ideas. In the same way that labor is doubly free under capitalism and that laborers are both free to work and free to starve, the concept of pluralism itself masks deep divisions in a society that it then obscures by giving equal weight to the needs, desires, and interests of all parties um, as though they enter the marketplace on the basis of equality. Liberals who cling to the ideal of value pluralism are too credulous, if not ideological. A socialist who hopes to do the same is going to likewise obscure the need to transform the social basis upon which people articulate competing values. The second socialist objection, number two, is that appeals to value pluralism adhere to a naive positivist method for understanding what people value. And Liam, I'm sorry, this is not me, this is them. They're... <laughs> 
Um, one might call to mind epistemic criticisms of polling as a way to, of understanding voters. It is notoriously difficult to get people to tell the truth in polls about fundamental questions of value because the questions can be suggestible. People worry about judgment and they respond differently to various formulations of poll questions. The problem is that this marketplace of ideas and sentiments is shaped by the actual marketplace that generates ideological distortions about the nature of a whole variety of social problems. Who is to say what people really value? The third and final socialist objection is that both the bourgeois nature of the ideal and its many ideological distortions lead to a hopelessly reformist political strategy. Committing oneself to maintaining a political structure that supports value pluralism in the present makes it nearly impossible to challenge the values that people currently have in a fundamental way. For instance, one might think that we must stop consuming so much stuff to save the planet, but we think we need lots more stuff than we do because the market suggests consumptive ways to live out our individual ideas of the good life and indeed to solve our problems. It's, har it's harmful to support such delusions when there are much more fundamental changes that need to take place. And some fundamental change requires challenging, not accepting, some fundamental values. My question is value pluralism about what and for who? As there is a broad agreement among both socialists and liberals on value pluralism's relationship to socialism, I wanna insert some critical comments about value pluralism's relationship to capitalism. I think that the socialists' ideology critique of value pluralism under capitalism is probably well taken. You can ask me about that later, but I'm doing something else. I'm pursuing a different angle. The angle that I pursue is not a critique of false needs and desires and their mystifying effects on the social structure. It is a critique of how capitalism constrains value pluralism in a systematic way, leaving to the side the matter of what people really want. Most of us want lots of things, family, friends, love, security, leisure, play, spiritual fulfillment, intellectual camaraderie. I'm gonna present a couple of examples that I lead me at least to doubt that value pluralism is all that in a capitalist society. In fact, I think capitalism clearly selects out some valuations against others um, according to what is morally, culturally, and politically compatible with its own way of valuing. The latter is the capitalist valorization process, if the uh, technical Marxian language um, helps clarify anything to those who are uh, ideologically inclined. <laughs> okay. Um, here's my first example. Now I have here, arrows represent market constraints. And I'm gonna proceed in a very Hegelian way. I'm gonna start with the individual, I'm gonna to move to the family, and then I'm gonna move on to civil society. It's gonna be very neat. So here's, uh, here's my first example. Now people in this room might relate to this uh, problem. Um, here's the worker, okay? This is a, the, maybe even a highly skilled worker, like many people uh, who get advanced degrees and higher education. And here's their home, the way they live. Now, uh, the labor market, is not a world in which you uh, have lots of choice. I don't know if you've heard, the labor market's very bad. <laughs> so uh, you may, in fact, just get one job, okay? And then you move across the, uh, across the world, across the country, um, you take what you get. Um, that's the reality. And maybe in the 80s, this particular industry was different. Um, but you may also, for example, have to uh, take on a lot of debt to finance your education, uh, to finance a very living in a very expensive city. And then both of these things, both the constraints of the labor market and uh, the constraints of the cost of living uh, may produce the result in which you simply have to leave, whether or not you actually wanted to leave or that's whether or not that is originally how you saw your life um, proceeding. Um, and also it's worth pointing out that capital doesn't have so many of the same uh, constraints. The second example I have that builds on the first is, a, is nursing homes. Um, why do I point this out? Uh, mostly because I, I come from a place in which the way that we treat old people is just a, a, entirely inhuman and one wonders why. Um, but here is, for example, a smaller, uh, a small family. Um, the family is uh, something that, uh, 
it's not a standalone institution. In capitalist societies, um, in general, fertility rates tend to go down, um, and people tend to have fewer children as the economy uh, develops. And the reason for this is that private households sort of absorb the responsibility of reproducing the individuals in the household. So you start only having the children that you can afford. Okay, and then we often develop very punitive language towards poor people who fail to control their uh, reproduction. Um, and then we have these ideas about overpopulation, like the problem is, is they're not using birth control um, or they're just having all kinds of promiscuous, irresponsible sex. So we start developing like a politics of what responsible family life is like. But the overall trends that happen is that as um, uh, the economic development uh, emerges, people, the, the demographic change also happens. So it used to be more rational to have like a lots of children. Why? You need them to work the farm. Okay. Like, and then there'll be a high rate of death. So you don't know if all your kids are going to make it. You need to replace them to have a kind of uh, labor force that is more uh, self-contained. Um, and so large families were very rational. Now, uh, small families, and you see population uh, de uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Not decrease, fertility, the rate, like the fertility rate goes, goes down. Okay, so you end up having only one or two children. The problem here is that um, even with like a smaller set of children, there's not like, and then you have to be leave the house. You often have to leave the town you grew up in. Uh, small family sizes come at um, a cost over the course of someone's life. So you have to wonder if I'm not there to take care of my parents or my grandparents, who will be there? Okay, and then you have to uh, figure out some kind of financial way to make sure that they're cared for. And this is something that like, is pretty endogenous to capitalist development. It's not something that ever existed before, the nursing home. Okay, and then they have increased medical needs. Um, and then it becomes rational to put people in, in homes because if you live on the other side of the world or the other side of the country, who else is going to care? for these people. And you might think, my God, I don't want my, my, my parent to be in an underfunded nursing home. It looks, you know, I've been in there. It looks like the night of the walking dead sometimes. It's very like shocking. And no one wants, everyone wants their parents to be somewhere comfortable and so on. But there's a selection process in which this becomes rational as opposed to um, some other arrangement. So when I talk about the constraints of market forces, I'm not talking about there only being one choice, but an overall selection mechanism towards a certain range of choices, okay? Um, so yeah, my, my point, my first point is that there's not no value pluralism in capitalism. It's that capitalism's version of it has a shape, okay? That range of choices that gets created. Um, valuing itself is not a quantitative exercise, but qualitative. It does not simply have greater or fewer choices. Rather, one experiences a certain type and quality to choices, as well as the free, uh, rather one experiences a certain type and quality, as well as the free pluralist debate agitation and compromise in which one engages. So not all things are possible at one time. In a liberal society, which are generally those dominated by market imperatives, the political content of pluralism is often not only a negotiation of the appropriate manner in which one's comprehensive uh, worldview can affect others, but also how to live by that worldview in a setting that may radically challenge it. Um, consider a final, more uh, political example. And geopolitics. So here's uh, another example. So you have... Um, an organization, so NGOs are like non-governmental organizations. They usually don't pay uh, taxes and they get some amount of state funding and they usually are, are uh, also funded by private donors and large uh, foundations and corporations and so on. Um, and they often have work on kind of uh, interest group causes. Okay, so like representing some minority group, representing women, uh, representing the concerns of tenants or, um, uh, even sadly landlords or whatever. So you have a, a kind of way of um, uh, lobbying. Yeah, the, and, and their political project, they are often uh, lobbyists, they're often providing direct community services, um, and they're a way that civil society starts to represent different constituencies, at least toward the end of the, the 20th century. They can also be quite imperialist in nature. So you can think about the kinds of NGOs that go into uh, underdeveloped countries and say, you know, we're gonna, uh, we have all this funding to bring you various forms of uh, infrastructure or, um, 
um, we're going to help like give you um, resources, teach you how to, uh, I don't know, navigate markets, give it, get education and so on and so forth. Um, the problem is with this way of doing politics, this seems nice. I'm giving uh, community services, direct provisions, we're, we're doing, we're helping for development. Um, and here's the community over here. The problem is, is that these people have no resources on their own. They have to request money. And the dynamic that ends up happening is that they spend quite a bit of time uh, begging um, various foundations uh, and ca capital at large for, uh, funding for their infrastructure and day-to-day -day operations. So the type of civil society that emerges within the constraints of an economy dominated by market competition is also of a certain type. So you can see that there's like pluralism here. Um, I, I gave numerous examples of the kinds of things NGOs are doing. They do a lot of things. And they are a way of kind of engaging, like influencing the state. Um, to do things. They are a way of distributing resources, but it is of a certain quality. They do it in a certain way. Okay. What these examples are meant to show is that in both political and personal matters, market imperatives select for some values over others. One can value family above all else, but you might still put your parent in a nursing home. An NGO can say that it is building community, but spend most of its time raising money for rich people or the foundations that they control. Okay, and this is gonna select against doing other things. Actions speak louder than words. My second point is that liberal pluralism is not all that it seems. It's not actually neutral about the good life that it encourages individuals to lead or the projects that they might engage in with others at least not in societies where capitalist market imperatives dominate their rules for reproduction, as Robert Brenner would put it. There are many con conflicts between market constraints and having pluralism as a fundamental value. Unsurprisingly, therefore, there is a long history of socialists of all stripes um, pointing this conflict out. Indeed, the socialist calculation debate revolves around it. So recall that earlier slide that I had hand up about the kind of model that could work. There's a legacy of people uh, trying to figure out how to get um, uh, maybe a market socialist mo model to work and they debate about how to do that. In this debate, socialists have argued that socialism is a viable alternative to capitalism using different models. And I'll come back to those, but I'll focus on the critical thrust of the socialist case first, because it's not just about what could work, it's also about the way that capitalism works. Everyone agrees that capitalism is distinct for making incommensurable values commensurable through the price mechanism. Market demand provides observable data about what people value to competitive firms that can respond with prices that reflect a social average. Okay, so you find an equilibrium. But what's controversial is the idea that these are the only calculations that are possible. The central planner, Otto Neurath, for example, is part of the Vienna Circle, argued that the price mechanism is a value-ridden bait and switch that sweeps its normatively controversial content under the analytical rug. From his perspective, money stands in relation to prices like an individual value judgment stands in relation to a social convention. There are constraints that precede its use, part of which is the pre-political judgment that absolute values are ultimately commensurable in the way that the price mechanism says that they are. The Swedish social Democrat Gunnar Myrdal delves deeper. He writes that classical and neoclassical value theory had no doubt that they were dealing with commensurable psychological quantities, which could, in principle, be observed in spite of any practical difficulties in doing so. Any, and this is a quote, any doubt about this would have undermined their whole system. Why would doubt on the score undermine the whole system? And this is where I think you see the problem of pluralism start to emerge as a kind of like a, a meta theme in these debates. The central premise is that values are commensurable because they are ultimately harmonious. If they weren't harmonious, then they couldn't be entered into the calculation as a definite quantity. They couldn't be compared. Otherwise, you would have conflict instead of equilibrium. There is, according to Myrdal, 
an ironic communistic fiction at the heart of both classical and neoclassical theories of value. Bet you didn't expect that twist in the capital. <laughs> The difference between the latter and the former, the classical and neoclassical theories, and I don't know how familiar people are with these debates, but if you want to know more about neoclassicism, I can try to field some questions later. Um, the difference between these different ways of thinking, which you can, if you want to imagine who, who, who classicists are, you can think about Malthus, you can think about Ricardo, you can think about Marx, Adam Smith, and neoclassicals, uh, Hayek, is a good name. Uh, Milton Friedman is a good name. These are kind of different generations of thinking about this issue. Um, the difference between these traditions is that neoclassicals cease to confront the issue by claiming that market, the market is value neutral, whereas classical economic theory leaned directly on utilitarian morals. So it gives Gunnar Myrdal the, the license to claim that there is a communistic fiction at the heart of neoclassical theories of value is that the, the presumption is that there is a single utility that can be maximized that is good for the whole society. And so um, this is actually the, the intellectual basis. The difference between the classicals and the neoclassicals is that the neoclassicals stopped justifying utilitarianism and started just saying, it doesn't matter for all practical purposes, we can make these things commensurable. So they stopped trying to do like metanormative stuff. Um, and actually it's kind of a sign of defeat. They were like, we can't find this social harmony, but we're just gonna, for practical purposes, say that we can. Okay. Um, the suggestion here is that posits of value neutrality in the economy can only be done in bad faith, okay? Through that kind of bait and switch where you're like, I know I can't justify this, but I will anyway, because it works. According, according to Neurath, what the economy is, however, is a complex of judgments about human values and how human beings want to organize their lives together, no more and no less. Any evasion of the intrinsically political nature of these judgments is an evasion of digging too deeply into fundamental values, not a response to the criticism. If one is serious about value pluralism as something valuable, then one must start at the beginning instead of presuming that capitalist markets are most suitable for it. So there's a charge of circularity happening here. Um, so I'm gonna shift to kind of a different normative uh, framework. Um, the, the abstract, I, I said that we're gonna talk about Republican socialism. And if you recall in the intro, I said, Republican uh, socialism is gonna get help from its Republican friends. So um, I'm gonna tell you now what I think Republicanism clarifies and adds to this conversation about value pluralism. One way of summary, summarizing what I'm saying is that there is a mode of production of value pluralism. Pluralism has a shape that is relative to the conception of freedom that a society uses to measure, compare, and deliberate about its priorities. One does not simply deliberate about matters of deep concern in the public sphere. One also experiences a certain type and quality to the free pluralist debate, agitation, and compromise in which one engages. Representing such debate as though it is analogous to a free marketplace of ideas is a way of evacuating liberalism's most controversial value commitments from the debate about values itself. Namely, the communistic fiction that there is social harmony instead of genuine conflict behind the money. What I think the Republican principle of non-domination adds to this discussion is a way of evaluating this mode of production. So you understand that, just mode of production, mode of production of value pluralism. Liberal value pluralism is not only liberal in content, i.e. a system of basic rights and liberties, but also in form. Instead of having one homogenous state actor, it has a relatively independent civil society. But it also has a relatively independent capitalist class on which civil society and much of the state apparatus depends through tax revenue, investment, investment, straight up corruption, and so on. Recall the NGO slide. In principle, one can use liberal norms like liberty and equality to argue against capitalism. I've seen people do it very well. On the other hand, I'm not convinced that these norms 
are fit to conceptualize this web of dependencies within a social totality and then say why it should be otherwise. My reason for this doubt is liberalism's persistent denial that there is a historically distinct social form of freedom that is at issue here. Liberal market freedoms realize the real social harmony that already exists. Non-domination, on the other hand, the Republican idea, gives me more to work with, although it hardly settles the matter. The reason that freedom as non-domination is attractive is that it is a way of saying that freedom has a shape. Non-domination is a competing conception of freedom to liberalism insofar as it insists that a free individual can only exist in a free society. Okay, so whatever non-domination means, when you live in a non as an individual in a non-dominated world, you have to live in a society that is also free. By free society, Republicans mean one in which individuals are not subject to arbitrary power, where no individual is at the mercy of another who has a capacity to interfere in their lives in a capricious way. So I'm gonna repeat that because I, I have no doubt that in the Q&A, there'll be questions about Republicanism. So I'll just say it again. By free society, they mean a society in which individuals are not subject to arbitrary power, where no individual is at the mercy of another who has a capacity to interfere in their lives in a capricious way. The word arbitrary does a lot here. Republicans use the example of a benevolent slave master to make the difference between this idea of freedom and the liberal one more clear. If a slave master is benevolent, causing no harm to their slave and treating them well, the slave remains dominated because they are at the mercy of their benevolence. Okay, so Quentin Skinner and Philip Pettit would be the kind of neo-Republicans um, that sort of started developing this in the eight, late 80s and 90s. What is at stake for neo-Republicans are the background conditions that grant ca capacities for arbitrary power, like one might say a class structure. <coughs> Not all Republicans do say so, however, as there is a spectrum of conservative to radical Republican views, just as there is a spectrum of liberal views. Uh, for instance, classical Republicans view the state as the only source of political power, not the social structure itself. But the more radical Republicans have pointed out some interesting things. For them, the relationship between social structure, the form, and the social character, the content, are very important. If domination is a capacity for exercising arbitrary power, then the person who is dominated is dependent on another such that they have that capacity. And dependency has a number of deleterious effects. Not only does dependency enable domination, but it also inhibits virtuous character formation. When one is dependent, one cannot cultivate the independence of mind that is the stuff of moral character and responsible citizenship. Radical Republicans see this problem as a social one that results from a dominant logic of action within certain social relations. So it's not just the state. For this group, which includes feminists, abolitionists, and the labor movement, dependency is a problem for virtue and lack of virtue reflects problematic dependencies um, in a system logic. Okay, so we're moving from just thinking about just the state to thinking about a system logic, a social structure um, that has certain um, patterns of, of development. Okay, laws of motion is what Marx would have called it. Lack of virtue is functionally the same thing as being constrained from partaking in freedom enhancing behaviors, which leads to corruption. In the Republican tradition, Corruption is like an atrophy in the capacity of human reason to generalize beyond partial narrow interests. It is a lack of virtue that deforms a person's moral character. But for the radicals, it is derivative of certain constraints that are constituted in concrete social relationships. So there is a conceptual fusion between interest and virtue. Um, one can either appreciate the general interest or not, as dependence involves mental subjection and lack of capacity for political imagination. 
So um, you may have read Mary Wollstonecraft. She makes this argument very strongly that the problem is that women in the 18th century, um, it's not that they cannot think or they are not able to uh, be rational actors, it's that their dependency relationship with men prevents them from having a wider and more generalizable political imagination. It prevents them from imagining and wanting different things than they already do. So it's, she's not saying that they can't reason, she's saying that they can't reason in a particular way that would be better. To bring this excursus through Republican theory, political theory back around to pluralism, what I think Republican non-domination adds is a way of thinking about the kind of value pluralism, that value pluralism that a society is after. It can become a criticism of capitalist hegemony through an analysis of arbitrary power, dependency, and vulnerability, more directly confronting the irreducible problem of value at the heart of political freedom. In what form of life do we want to live do we want to live in a society that depends on the rate of profit as a me metric for what can even become valuable? Are the individuals in a society free in such a state of dependence on market commensurability between their values? Are individuals free in a society that is endemically lacking in its capacity to conceptualize general interests because they conflict with market imperatives? These are the questions that I have. So much for the diagnosis. As for the prognosis, the other question I have is why not socialism? Here I'll end my presentation with some responses to the set of liberal and socialist objections that I started with. To respond to the liberals, many of their arguments turn on the assumption that socialism must be a centrally planned economy from top to bottom. That's a matter of fact. That is the kind of political conception of what socialism is and could be. The first objection that socialism is homogenizing, undermining of social difference, and thereby denies politics should be less convincing one, once one both sees that capitalism does the same and, as Aaron Beninov recently put it, why can't the socialism of the future, quote, be composed of overlapping partial plans which interrelate necessary and free activities rather than a single central plan? Planning might be qualitatively different than in the past, leaving a more limited scope to market mechanisms, but incorporating other values into the mainstream of economic life. So um, remember Aaron once told me that uh, he imagines um, having a more democratic scheme for uh, public investment that don't just go to uh, economic development, but investing in the arts and creativity that people control. What kinds of things do we want to see us be able to do? In fact, to respond to the don't be an American rube objection, there may be varieties of socialism after all, which depend on how people turn the institutional structures that currently exist into something else. It will still be true that the North American socialism will look different from the European socialism, which will look different from the South American socialism because the state institutions are currently quite different as are the developmental needs. For instance, I envision a large and illustrious project of building electric rail all across the Great Plains of North America, where farmers there have a council that coordinates price of grain with the rancher council in the Southwest who are sending livestock to Chicago. I can imagine the co-determination system in Germany turning managerial control entirely to the workers, while the trade unions become responsible for active labor market policies that they coordinate with an investment council. There are therefore many ways to have a socialism that does not have one central authority that is particularly vulnerable to corruption. Checks and balances can continue to exist, but not in the same bourgeois way as we might have put it. This is what we call the transformation or the withering away of the state. Indeed, a Republican socialism would insist on checks and balances, transforming the terms of existing interdependent relationships into ones that grant equal standing to the individuals to whom the political community owes equal concern. It wouldn't be about independence in the classical Republican sense, 
but about non-arbitrary forms of interdependence that grants individuals the capacity to negotiate differences in value or in emphasis. But this sort of vision is only possible in a society whose laws of motion, as Marx would have said, allow us to dream, not one whose laws of motion consider our dreams to be externalities for met forever on the margins of social life. At this point, I hope to assuage the socialist worries that value pluralism is hopelessly bourgeois, positivist in the derogatory sense, or reformist. First, I think it is hardly bourgeois to say that what is needed is a transformation of what we even consider the economy to be. That's a consequence of my argument that the basic question confronting us is what form of life we want to lead. Disrupting the neoclassical logic of externalities requires a different conception of what the economy is supposed to do. Like free us from necessity, rather than tie our vision of what necessity even is to the imperatives of an underlying compulsion that we do not control which is the rate of profit in its particular patterns of economic growth. Second, positivism is not really an issue at all. I'm not taking observable preferences at face value. I'm assuming that they will change. But liberals are right to say that a tolerant and democratic society must accept that no one within it really knows what others want or will want in the future. One criticism of socialism that lands for me is the repeated assumption that socialists think they know what other people will want in our coming utopia. We don't and we can't. They might want some traditional things, some non-traditional things, or they might want to adapt old traditions to the new ones, just as they did in the transition to capitalism. I think what is desirable is a future where people can sort themselves out rather than a future where one assumes that people have to change in a particular way, except to make an existential gamble that living freely in this way will remove incentives for us to adapt for the worse and instead adapt for the better. Finally, last paragraph, is it reformist? Maybe, but not hopelessly so. I agree that there are some values that need to be challenged fundamentally, like the actual valorization pro process of capital. The materialist in me says that doing so requires non-reformist reforms that expand capacity for people to act freely in the present, to give us more people to work with, creating more buy-in and expertise that a free future society certainly needs. That much is needed to orchestrate a rupture with something so serious as the dominant imperatives of an economic global system. The same materialist voice also tells me that people will change the process, but as I said, I don't know what they will change into. Making an existential gamble requires respecting the outcome. For my part, I think socialists today should worry much less about the cultural bankruptcy of the present, keeping their eyes on the horizon of the richer, warmer culture that is yet to come, a place where, as Neurat once wrote, the kind person can feel at home. And of course, bringing about the material conditions that are required for it to flourish. Thank you.